Hi there. My name is Martin Osis from Martin on Mushrooms, and I wanted to share a video, a presentation that I did at the Alberta Mycological Society Expo held at the Devonian, or actually the U of A Botanic Garden, um, a couple of weeks ago. I had a pretty big turnout, about 150 people in the classroom, and I had some requests from people that they wanted to, a little bit more information and some of the resource material. So I thought that I would uh, share this presentation with you guys and uh, and go through it. Um, I've cut it down a little bit uh, so it's not quite as long. You know, when I've got people trapped kind of in a room or a place, I, I can drone on and on. And I'm going to try and cut this a little bit shorter if possible. So anyways, um, yeah, the presentation is all mushrooms are medicinal and uh, let's get going on it. There we go. Excellent. All mushrooms are medicinal. Um, the first thing that I wanted to share with you was some of the references that I used. Um, the references mostly come from Robert Rogers, who is a uh, registered herbalist from the American Herbal Guild. Also, he was a professor at Grant McEwen or at McEwen University and also at the U of A actually teaching some uh, drug, drug and herbal interaction courses for med students and uh, and whatnot. So he's compiled a number of books. One is The Fungal Pharmacy, which is kind of the, the big tome, and uh, then delved a little bit more into human clinical clinical trials of uh, where there's actually good research on it. And a lot of it is basically brought together in this lovely little synopsis called uh, Medicinal Mushrooms of Western Canada. Um, Robert and I have known each other for a number of years. And in fact, we worked together to start the North, start the medicinal mushroom um, committee for the North American Mycological Association. And in fact, uh, Robert was the first chair of that. Um, so he's got a lot of background um, and a lot of knowledge. And so I've, these are these are the books that I've used for, for resources here. And, uh, and they're available, actually a lot of them through the, AMS, but uh, but on Amazon and and stuff. So so uh, if you're interested in the topic, uh, you can certainly delve a little bit deeper into it. Um, one of the places where I want to start is just talk a little bit about the difference between fungi and mushrooms, and I think this is so critical for people to uh, to understand um, that uh, that mushrooms are much more than than just that little fruiting body that we see fleetingly appear in front of us and then disappear. So typically what we see is we see the reproductive stage of mushrooms um, when they pop out of a log or the ground or, or wherever they're, wherever they're fruiting. Um, and what we don't see is the actual organism. And this is a really long lived organism. Some of these organisms are speculated to be six, 7,000 years old and they, kind of calculate that by the size of their growth and how fast they grow every year. And it's growing this big and now it's this big, it's gotta be really, really old. So so we know that uh, there's lots of uh, examples of this. So what we don't see are these little strands of the hypo, of the hyphal uh, organism, which basically sits under the ground or or in an old rotting log. And, and basically this is the organism doing its work. So the fungi is typically made up of these little hyphal strands. Um, and that's again, when it's not fruiting, this is what we don't see. Um, and typically when they hypha make up a, a network, it, we call it mycelium. And mycelium is where all, all the action is. That's where all the interaction is with the bacteria, with trees, with with uh, with viruses, with all kinds of insects and and different things, and uh, and basically it just creates an active living network of biological activity and all kinds of chemical compounds that are created to deal with everything that's going on here outside of our view. And when the conditions are perfect, and the mushroom 
feels that it's time to reproduce, it's got enough energy and it's got enough resources, then it starts throwing out a fruiting body and the hyphae, the same hyphae they make, that make up the mycelium, make up the mushroom that we see poking out of the ground for, for two days, three days, or sometimes for many years, as in, as in the case of, of polypores. So they form this fruiting structure and they put off their spores and they reproduce. Um, fungi are really closely related to the animal kingdom, um, much closer related to the animal kingdom than to plants. I mean, typically, we've always thought of them for or for many, many years, we thought of them as part of the plant kingdom. Um, and this kind of myth is per perpetuated, you know, every time we walk into the grocery store and among in the vegetable section, we find our mushrooms, we should be finding our mushrooms in the meat section, because they're much more closely related to the animal kingdom than they are to the plant kingdom. And because of this, we have lots of similar activities to the animal kingdom. You know, one of the reasons cats lick themselves is because they create vitamin D when they sit out in the sunlight and they, they basically they basically pick it up by cleaning themselves. So it's, it's they're doing their vitamin D thing. Mushrooms produce tremendous amounts of vitamin D um, when, when in sunlight. One of the tests that was, or one of the experiments that was done in Japan is they took a, 100 grams, about four ounces of shiitake mushrooms um, that were basically just trimmed and left out in the sun. And what they discovered is that over one hour, this 100 grams of mushrooms created over 100,000 international units of vitamin D. And when we consider how much that is, you know, the Canadian government says we on average need 400 international units for our own use. The Americans actually have gone a little higher. I think they're the 2,000 international units, um, which is kind of strange because Americans have way warmer climate and way and people are exposed to much more sunlight and yet there they're thinking that you need more of this stuff um so um so vitamin d fungi produce just like we do and the other thing that fungi do just like we do when we look at this little mushroom here we can see um and this is a little guy i think he's a unnamed little mushroom that that's growing on uh growing on a rotting poplar log. Um, when you look at the top of the cap, the top of the cap has got this kind of layer of slime, but where it's exposed to sunlight, we see that it's tanning, it's turning black. And when we look at the one mushroom that's underneath that's out of the sunlight, well, it's not turning black. And mushrooms use melanin and they tan just like we do. And they tan for exactly the same reasons. Um, melanin has this w amazing way of dealing with all kinds of radiation and gamma radiation. They basically take energy from the sun and actually utilize it in the organism um, and uh, and protect it from from the ill effects of uh, of radiation, just like just like we do, same thing, and and fungi use those same same processes that that uh, that we in the animal kingdom do as well. Um, also, when we take a look at closer at at the fungal cells, and typically, you know, where all the activity is is in the hyphal tips, we see all of the organelles that basically we see in in the animal kingdom. So we've got <clears throat> we've got mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum where pro, uh, where proteins get bent and put together and one of the neatest things i think that fungi have um, is that they've got lots and lots of these microtubules that basically sit in their hyphal tips and microtubules are basically the fundamental information processing device in biology and not just a processing device Pro, uh, the storage of the, the the storage of information happens in these microtubules, and um, so a lot of our nerves and nerve sheath and and in our brains we have lots of microtubules, and they're thinking that's where lots of our memories are basically preserved. And the way the elect the electricity flows through the microtubules, it just basically spreads through this in all kinds of directions and it instantaneously can gather up information um, to, uh, to, well, we in our brains make 
conclusions of what we need to do. We can instantly analyze a whole bunch of information. And this is what the microtubule is about. Um, really important in reflex action and movement. Um, they uh, they uh, are thinking that some of this activity is similar to that, that to what we have in what we call muscle memory. So when you pick up a guitar and, and off you go and the fingers just move to where they should, um, this maybe maybe uh, directed by microtubules. So all of this kind of action is happening inside fungi. And because of this, fungi also are producing all of these chemicals, which are similar to the chemicals that we're producing. And we can borrow a lot of these chemicals. And this is what makes a lot of mushrooms medicinal. So again, just like us, mushrooms use and the and the hyphae uses 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 action potentials to send signaling down the hyphae, and very much just like our our nerve systems do, we send action potentials, and 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 we signal from our brain to our feet to 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 our hands to all of our fine motor operation skills are basically done through these nerves. And fungi basically have the same kind of mechanisms. Um, in fact. Trees typically will borrow this when they're signaling one another. So when one tree gets gets an attack by an aphid, because they've got a micro, they're connected by a micro, mycorrhizal network, they'll send signals to other trees to warn them that there's aphids in the area or there's whatever in the area and we're under attack and to start mounting up defenses. So very, very interesting. And, uh, and again, a very animal kingdom like operation and so when we look at our circulatory system and here is an example of what it looks like in our hand and arm this looks very much like mycelium um, and of course what we have we not just have this we've got skin covering it and we've got nerve cells and a whole nerve network we also have structural bones and things like that well, for fungi, everything is in this hyphae. So they do everything. They're, they're their circulatory system, they're their nervous system, the gastrointestinal system. This is where enzymes are leached out into the into the into the habitat around to to consume and, and pick up minerals and and break down enzymes to break down all kinds of uh, um, organic material to get the sugars out of it. Um, it's also it also becomes a re reproductive system as they form mushrooms and and also their structural system and that structural system can be fairly robust if anybody's ever you know tapped on a on a 30 year old uh, 30 year old artist conch or something like that it's hard like a rock so for fungi everything's in the hyphae and it does all of these all of these things is all done by the hyphae um, where we have different mechanisms to do some of the different things. Um, also wanted to talk about bacteria because bacteria are really important um, to fungi because they kind of evolved together and they evolved together, you know, since the beginning of the primordial soup. And uh, they've been sharing the same food base and the same habitat and they're competing against each other. And a lot of times they get together and they cooperate. Just like our microbiome in our guts and on our skin and everywhere, we're covered with bacteria and these guys are helping us make vitamins and break down food and digest things. And fungi have the same kind of kind of um, kind of relationship with bacteria, both on the outside and on the inside of their uh, of the of the hypha. And again, what they're also doing is they're competing for food and they're competing for space in the habitat. And so there's a lot of competition. So fungi and bacteria have uh, developed ways of dealing with each other. Um, so for example, here we've got penicillin, which is, uh, which of course um, is an antibiotic that we're very familiar with. And actually we can harness the power of penicillin to to deal with bacterial infections that we have. Um, so basically the penicillin goes out and 
because they're competing for the same habitat, they're basically killing their competition. And they've got a number of different methods of doing it. Um, so they've got lots of lots of separate mechanisms, which is a really important thing because they've got the separate mechanisms. Um, the bacteria don't really develop an immunity to them or become resistant to them because if this doesn't work, it's going to throw something else at it. Um, and, and so the fungi are like the bacteria are, are evolving. The fungi are evolving at the same time to basically deal with, with this, uh, with, with the bacteria that it's in competition with and in cooperation with. Um, here we see it in morels. It's very interesting. It's a study done, I think, in the early uh, 2013, 2012. Um, some Swiss researcher, researchers, a microbiologist and a mycologist, got together and looked at the relationship between bacteria and morels. And so what they did is they, they uh, put some uh, radioactive dye in the bacteria so they could actually trace it. And what would happen is that a lot, some of the bacteria is outside the, the hyphae, some is inside, and the mushrooms would actually shuttle this bacteria around. And when we look at those culture plates, what they did is they had a couple of areas where they had some morels, and then they put the bacteria on, and basically what the morels did is they just gathered up all the bacteria and aggregated it in different areas. And this is what morels do with bacteria in nature as well. And they basically store them, store all the bacteria in their sclerotia. And the sclerotia is the place where new mushrooms form. So every year you got this little hard nodule where the where the new mushroom is, the new morel is going to come out. And so there's high concentrations of, of living bacteria because the mushrooms are keeping the bacteria alive with all kinds of different metabolites. So they have a very, very strong relationship and a critical, just like we have with our microbiome, to produce all kinds of compounds that the, that the uh, bacteria can produce at a much lower cost than, than the mushroom can produce or the, the fungus can produce on its own. Um, and just wanted to touch a little bit on quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is uh, is how bacteria communicate. So basically, they chemically talk to each other. And when you have one lone bacteria, it sits pretty nervously by itself, kind of like uh, like squirreled away in in some basement basement room or basement office where nobody will ever talk to it, where it's going to be safe. And when you start getting more bacteria together, they start communicating, and then they start building these things called biofilms. And biofilms are are this kind of pussy-like stuff that basically what it does, it, it, it surrounds the bacteria with this viscous fluid that prevents a lot of the enzymes and the chemicals that macrophages and white blood cells and different things are producing and fungi are producing that that actually can go in and kill the bacteria. And uh, and so this quorum sensing in the biofilms is really, really critical. And when finally bacteria get enough of it, get enough of itself together, enough, enough uh, kind of partners together, then all of a sudden it can become virulent. And fungi muck around with this signaling and they disrupt the signaling that the bacteria um, the, the bacteria use so it can actually get in and and deal with the bacteria and kill it or manipulate it to to uh, to develop too too quickly or to develop slowly and allow make the bacteria vulnerable to attack. This is research that's being done with um, with uh, with antibiotic resistant bacteria is figuring out how do we deal with this. And fungi have been dealing with this for millennia. So here we've got the guts of the talk. The, uh, well, it's about edible mushrooms. So we're gonna focus on those. And we're gonna talk about a few poisonous mushrooms and how some of those edible mushrooms that we talk about can be poisonous and so how some of the poisonous mushrooms can be edible and of course the medicinal nature of of them across the board
Um, so basically the premise is, is that all mushrooms are medicinal and mushrooms are medicinal in their activity and in their compounds. They're mostly made up of chitins, which are polysaccharides, about 20% of them are glucosamines. You know, a lot of people are taking glucosamines, again, for their, for our own structural use in building collagen and, and, and repairing joints and stuff like that. Mushrooms produce lots of vitamin D, um, as we talked about earlier. And the vitamin D is really important for a process called apoptopsis, and that's allowing for the natural death of cells. So if you've got a cell that is starting to proliferate and it doesn't die, this is typically the definition of a cancer cell. Um, so these cells naturally have to, to die and our macrophages come along, our white blood cells come on, come along and basically clean these things up. Um, lots of mushrooms sequester heavy metal. Um, they bond really easy to them and they pass these just as easily as they bond to them and 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 pick them up just as easily they pass them along so a lot of times they'll pass them along to trees and there's some work being done on sequestering heavy metals into into tree trunks and things like that um, mushrooms produce melanin which we talked about and other antioxidants um, and of course deal with bacteria for a long time they also have lots of statins in them so they're dealing with cholesterol they're dealing with triglycerides um, and lowering the low density lipoproteins and increasing the high density, the, the good cholesterol, and uh, lots of research on all of that stuff that's been ongoing. When we look a little closer into the medicinal actions, there's many, and I'm not going to go through this in detail. You guys can stop the video and, and look at it in a little bit more detail, but antibacterial, antiviral, anti-tumor, analgesic pain killing, control of blood sugar, lots of research is being done right now on that, anti-cholesterol, um, and uh, of course there's lots of debate on on the actual role of cholesterol, but uh, that's a different thing, hypertension, um, and cordyceps is a really cool one. It's uh, it's uh, It should be, in, in, in my opinion, should be in every everybody's first aid kit, you know, if you want to help, help a cut heal up, like just about overnight, put some cordyceps on it. Um, and, and also lots of research in uh, treatment of all kinds of neural diseases and neural disorders from Parkinson's to Alzheimer's, um, memory depression, all of that, and lots of studies going on with, with that. And most of the mushrooms that we're going to talk about here um, are, uh, are, present in Alberta and good edible mushrooms and you don't even know you don't even know the compounds that you're that you're getting um, one of the first mushrooms I chose to feature here was the lobster mushroom so this one this is one that doesn't grow in Alberta we've got the green one the uh, the what we call the hypomyces luteovirens the green lobster it's a terrible name because it doesn't look anything like a lobster um, but this is a fairly famous and well-known edible mushroom. And in the last few years, there's been some reported poisonings that are coming from this delicious, edible, gourmet lobster mushroom. And, um, and what has been basically found out is that some of these mushrooms, especially the older ones, the older ones that are kind of turning from this, this orange color to to this kind of more deep red that you see up here in this corner and and have really deep red patchy spots where they're where the mushrooms are go growing growing old um, those ones are causing some gastrointestinal poisonings and uh, a good friend of the alberta mycological society paul kroger um at UBC, they they did some uh, they took some culture plates with all kinds of different bacteria and uh, and made some extracts from this mushroom and they applied it to the uh, to to the different bacteria and basically it just killed all of the all of the bacteria on all the plates that they tested on. So we know that this mushroom has got has got lots of antibacterial compounds and. Uh, so you have to be careful 
on how much of this gourmet delicious mushroom that you eat. Because if you eat way too much, you can overdose and do a number on your gut biome and you'll potentially get, can potentially get quite serious gastrointestinal distress from it. And that includes vomiting and diarrhea and general malaise. Um, so be careful with them. And, uh, and just remember that you're not just consuming the mushroom, you're consuming all of the, uh, all of the pharmaceutical compounds that are, that are in these mushrooms as well. Um, so the first couple that I just want to start with, really common ones in Alberta, the tinder conch, the amadou, fomis fomentarius, and the birch polypore, um, the razor strop, um, fomatopsis betulinus. These are two of the fungi that were found carried by the Iceman. That's the uh, the old, uh, the, the, the guy they found frozen in the Italian Alps, about 5,300 years uh, old. And uh, so he was carrying two of these mushrooms across the glacier. Um, so the tinder conch, the tinder conch was used probably for a couple of different things. Um, one of them was to carry fire because if it's dry and you burn it, the it'll burn very, very slowly and you can actually carry your fire from one place to another. You'd light one of these things on fire and stuff it in a skull and and carry it along and and uh, when you get to uh, to wherever you're going, you can rekindle the fire and get it going. But more importantly, this mushroom has antibacterial properties, um, and it's uh, and it was used a lot of times by the ancient peoples. They would take these whole and throw them into stew pots and different things like that, and they would prevent the 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 food from spoiling. So they're doing some work with this on on its ability to disrupt this biofilm development and again, prevent spoilage of stuff. So really important, uh, really important fungi. Also, it works tremendously as a, as a, as a smudge and, and been used for smudge ceremonies, has a beautiful, pleasant smell to it. Um, but the important thing there is, is that it keeps bugs away and a lot of the insects are vectors for all kinds of disease. So for them, this was very, very important fungus um, to prevent illness, both for prevention and for treatment. Um, same with the, poly, uh, the, the birch polypore. Um, so the Iceman they knew was full of parasites. So it's antiparasitic on certain parasites, but more so it has strong laxative effect on, uh, on, uh, on people. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're, you're getting rid of a lot of your parasites basically by cleaning out the system. It's also anti-inflammatory, it's an antioxidant, and it stimulates interferon. Um, so as an anti-inflammatory, it could be used um, for joints and different things like that and, and whatever inflammatory conditions people have. Um, so stimulates interferon production and interferon basically creates cell-to-cell -cell immunity. So when one cell's sick, and has got issues, it puts off these interferon compounds, which basically provide the genetic information to this to its neighboring cells that it can ramp up a response to whatever's attacking it. So really important in our immune system. And so there's a lot of these fungi, especially a lot of these polypores that, uh, that create and stimulate this interferon production. One of the really well studied polypores is uh are the turkey tails this this one here tremanes versicolor um heavily studied in japan and in alberta we have some of them this one isn't quite as common as as some of our other ones the tremanes suaviolans which is a beautiful anise smelling one they uh again used a lot for for smudges and things like that and uh and some of our Tremides pubescens and hirsuta. They look very much like this, except the hirsuta is more hairy and the pubescens is just slightly hairy. But again, looking at the compounds, a lot of the compounds are very similar that they're finding in, uh, in the turkey tail itself. And some of those medicinal compounds are cytotoxic to cancers for lung, gastric, and especially hormonal cancers. So for uterine 
endometrial cancers, um, prostate cancers, it's antibiotic, it's antiviral, and lots of mushrooms are we're finding out now are prevent high blood sugar and stabilize blood sugars. Very, very important. And the polysaccharides also help with autoimmune disease by regulating the whole immune system. So one of our delicious edible mushrooms here, um, choice edible mushroom, morel. The morel is uh, actually quite a poisonous mushroom and you can get very sick by eating it if you don't cook it properly. The single greatest poisoning in uh, mushroom poisoning in North America happened at a banquet in Vancouver where 88 people were were hospitalized when the chefs put raw morels inside of a salad. Um, so delicious edible mushroom, but you got to be careful. You got to cook it properly. You need to know how to deal with it. It's got some interesting compounds that, again, are known to inhibit gastric and hepatic cancers. And again, more so it causes the apoptopsis, the death of cancer cells, um, which is really critical. It's very high in melanins. Melanins are very strong antioxidants. But more importantly, what melanins do is they work with this dealing with radiation, with gamma radiation and different things. And they're finding that in Chernobyl, these highly melanized, these black fungi are actually crawling to the radioactive hotspots and they're encasing those hotspots. And, uh, and they're literally eating the radiation kind of one electron at a time. Such an interesting process um that's happening and there and and the university of saskatchewan is actually studying this process and they're looking at some of these melanins in mushrooms um for a preventative preventative uh therapy for people who have been exposed to to radiation so typically when you're exposed to radiation the thyroid gets affected first with radioactive iodine. So you take iodine, um, so you fill up your thyroid, so there's no room for the radioactive stuff. The next place it hits is in the gastrointestinal system. And so in, at the U of S, they're looking at using melanins to see if they can actually protect the gastrointestinal system um, and prevent the, uh, the radiation from being absorbed in, into our cells. So very interesting research. Also, what we do know about morels is that a lot of them, and not just morels, but a lot of different mushrooms, chelate and accumulate heavy metals. So we know this because there's been lots of poisonings from eating morels coming from old apple orchards and places where historically in the 30s and 40s, they use all kinds of uh, mercury or, or lead-based uh, uh, pesticides and uh, and arsenic-based ones as well uh, for pesticides and herbicides. And these things stay in the soil and the morels basically pick them up. So if you're eating lots of mushrooms from these kind of places, you have the potential for heavy metal poisonings. And this is fairly well documented. There's some work now that they're looking at because it's because of the mushroom's ability to pick up these heavy metals, they're looking at the possibility if it can pick up heavy metals and chelate them out of out of uh, out of your body as well. So potentially, this might not only be a way of poisoning yourself, giving you heavy metal poisoning, but it also might be a way of of uh, preventing it or curing it. So a lot of interesting research going on with the edible morel. Um, here's the false morel. This one is certainly a poisonous one. It has the same poison as well, it has one of the same poisons that the morel has, uh, this monomethylhydrazine, which which is the main toxin in morels that has to be cooked off. This has the same, the false morel has the same one, um, but the false morel also has some gyromitrin, which are carcinogenic. And there's some some research being done where where there might be some compounds in this one that that are uh, that may cause ALS, which is one of the scariest uh, scariest diseases out there. So 
while it's eaten regularly in Europe and some people eat it here in North America, it's certainly not a good idea. It should be stricken off your list. So here's a poisonous mushroom that people eat and they boil the hell out of it. Um, but it's not a good idea. Well, and here we've got another poisonous mushroom or thought of as poisonous. And, and I guess it is poisonous because if you eat it, and uh, you cook it up lightly and you eat it, you can get some gastrointestinal distress, throwing up, vomiting, diarrhea, and lots of salivation. And uh, so just uncontrollable drooling. If you're, if you're breastfeeding, then you produce tons and tons of milk and uh, and so that's typically your poisoning. The poisoning ends with uh, with with deep coma-like sleep. Um, and in between the poisoning and the coma-like sleep, well, some people go on quite an interesting trip. Um, so, but these ones are started, starting, people are starting to consume them because what they do is they blanch them and they soak them in salt water, pour off the water. The toxins are all... The toxins are all uh, water soluble and basically you can remove a lot of the toxins and it's supposed to be quite a delicious mushroom. Typically in Alberta, we get these kind of yellow ones and the yellow to orange ones rather than the bright red ones. So the toxins in the compounds that actually make you sick or potentially make you sick are called ibotenic acid and muscimol. And these these compounds are what they call GABA agonists. And GABA is a, is a neural in, inhibiting um, uh, compound. So a lot of, there's a lot of drugs called gabapentine and, and different things and GABA-based drugs that are used for as analgesics and for nerve pain, for tremors. A lot of work is being done in Parkinson's disease. And what they're also finding out is this, this same the, the same GABA actually latches on to our ACE2 receptor sites, the same ACE2 receptor site that, that allows the, the COVID to actually come into our bodies and come into our systems. That's, that's where it attaches to. And this mushroom will block that. So it's known as an anti antiviral. So again, used for pain and, um, uh, and and especially the nerve pain and lots of work being done for tremors and and different things also an anti-inflammatory mushroom and again probably because it's just modifying the the uh the pain signaling that's going on and uh and ramping up infl inflammatory reactions um so very strong medicinal mushroom Here's one of our edible mushrooms. Unless you eat tremendous amounts of them, you can get sick from these. Um, one of the one of the portobellas or one of the agaricus species is agaricus blazii, which is well known to be a very very strong antibacterial. So similarly, um, there's probably most of the agaricus in our in our neck of the woods also probably have these characteristics. They've not been studied that well because agaricus are really difficult to get to species. So it's hard to hard to study something that you're not quite sure exactly what it is. And uh, so what you want to do is identify it exactly. So this takes sequencing and there's there's lots of homework to be done in in this whole group of agaricus. Um, but potential anti-inflammatory, hypoglycemic, hypocholesterol, um, and uh, actions that are predicted these ones haven't gone through to trial mostly because a lot of the same polysaccharides and fiber and antioxidants um, that are present typically work in other compounds so there's no reason to think that that it won't work with these agaricus and uh, and these agaricus portobello are fairly easy to identify um, one of the neat things is that they have a a stem that'll basically break off the cap kind of like a ball and socket joint. They always have have the the veil, sometimes a thicker double veil, sometimes just this kind of flimsy thin one. 
And when you look at the mushroom, you can see that the gills are free from the stalk. And you see it in both of these mushrooms. And the reason you're getting a spore color change is that just like the little white buttons that you buy in the grocery store, when you look at the gills, they're white. And if you just leave them around and let them develop, they'll slowly turn, they'll slowly turn pink and end up being this deep chocolate brown like you see in a uh, in a portabella. And when we look at that, that's an that's a large uh, Tim Hortons cup, coffee cup. As so, as you can see, these are massive, massive mushrooms, six, eight inches across. Um, again, make sure they smell nice. We do have a couple of poisonous ones that are in the Xanthoderma group, and they stain yellow, and they smell bad. And uh, and if you got a cold, and you can't smell, you have COVID, and you can't smell don't go and eat don't go eating these mushrooms because you might not be able to actually tell the poisonous ones and when you put them in a fry pan and even fry them the smells get get even worse as you're cooking them um so this is a telltale sign of this mushroom being potentially poisonous Fairy ring mushrooms. This is a a lovely mushroom and very accessible because it grows kind of in all most all of our lawns if we're lucky or our neighbors lawns or in parks and whatnot so in this area it grows its habitat is in grass and it grows in rings as you can imagine from its name um, its spore color is is white or actually just a little bit off white um, and the big thing with these ones here is to look at the gills. So you can't just look at the top of the mushroom. You got to look at the bottom of the mushroom. And, and you look at these wide, wide gills. And in between the gills, there's these intermediates that are in between. It's really very, very noticeable. And anything else that you're finding in fairy rings that doesn't look like this is something that you shouldn't be eating unless it's a portobello. Um, which we just talked about, and those are 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 unique as well. Um, one of the other things to keep in mind: the stalks are really, really tough. Um, so literally, I've taken these stalks when they're fresh and tried to break them. They won't. You can literally tie them in a knot, and uh, and that those are the characteristics that give you the fairy ring mushroom. And are these good for you? Absolutely. So medicinal uses, improves immune function and slows carcinogenesis. So the birth of cancer cells, lowers cholesterol. It's uh, antimicrobial and especially antibiofilm. So if you wanna make a nice mushroom soup and have it sit around on your stove for a couple of days, this is this is a great one. Um, and just as exciting, it's uh, been a constituent in traditional Chinese medicine of tendon easing powder. So again, uh, for joints and different things like that. And a lot of that is that glucosamine content and whatnot that, that comes in a nice natural form. Um, so tremendous edible mushroom. Um, this is this is one that, uh, that you can probably safely consume in uh, more consistently over time. But again, when you're eating mushrooms, you have to be careful. You might have a personal reaction to them. And uh, so when you start out, always start out slow. Puff balls, puff balls are bush first aid that goes back, back millennia. So if anybody ever cuts themselves, you take this puff ball and you break it open and you can put it on your on your hand on a cut, and it's basically sterile gauze with lots of fungal fungal compounds that are antibacterial that'll keep that'll keep a a, a wound clean and dressed. The ancients all ancients also used to take the dried ones that that you could puff, and they would puff the spores into the cuts to help clot the cuts and also for the antibacterial nature of the spores as well. So this is just number one first aid for when you're out in the woods. And when you pick them and cut them in half and they're nice and solid, they're, they're tremendous edible mushrooms as well. Again, you know, when you pick a 40 pound puffball, you have to be careful that you don't consume most of it 
because then you will get sick because of the because this stuff is going to knock out your gut bacteria um so here's another one that's uh, done a lot of been had a lot of studies done on it in Japan over the last 20 years and what they discovered with this mushroom is something that we thought previously that nerves couldn't be healed and what they found here with these parisium um lion's mane comb tooth bear head all basically the same same species or same uh same family of mushrooms uh, they've got nerve growth factors that stimulate new nerve growth and nerve healing not just nerve uh, not just healing of the nerve itself but also the myelin sheath so it's been used for for uh for people suffering from ms where the sheath breaks down and short circuits been used in uh in alzheimer's and other dementias for creating new neural links and also elongating the neurons that we already have in our brain and making new 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 connections with them um so help sleep disorders and depression um stabilizes blood sugars the same compounds that stimulate the neural growth also stimulates the pancreas to grow new islet cells and the islet cells are are where the insulin is produced and again been used for uh for for centuries in traditional chinese medicine for as a general tonic um, amongst other things um, oyster mushrooms well, here's another one from chinese medicine used for tendon easing powders really interesting so again likely because of the glucosamine maybe the vitamin d because it's exposed we know that it has lots of this apoptopsis which may be coming from the vitamin d component of of the uh, oyster mushroom um, full of statins there's some arguments how much statins will actually do um, and interestingly enough that in Chinese medicine, um, they don't use oyster mushrooms for heart pathologies. They use it for joints and things like that. Um, and it stabilizes blood sugars as well. So delicious mushroom. And and uh, this one, I don't know if you can poison yourself with this one. Interesting. Um, here's one that you can poison yourself with, and it's a delicious mushroom. This is a mushroom of hot and sour soup, the little, the little dark, what they call the cloud fungus, or the uh, the black fungus is uh, is auricularia, the woodier. So we find these growing in Alberta on on fir species. So we've got balsam fir, um, kind of in the boreal, and we've got alpine fir up in the alpine. Um, and we find these mushrooms. The biggest thing with these is that they've been used for, for centuries in traditional Chinese medicine for blood thinners. Um, but if you already on a blood thinner, this is absolutely contraindicated for you because if you get whatever bleed, whether it's a gastrointestinal bleed or, or you cut yourself, you know, you can actually have, uh, profuse bleeding because you're because you won't clot up um the chinese again used it to thin the blood um so to draw blood pressure and stuff like that it's also effective against uh cancer cells uh lung cervical and uh gastric and go back to robert's books for the details on those um common edible mushroom unless you drink so i don't know I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many people don't drink, but a lot of people don't eat this perfectly good mushroom because it has compounds in it that will prevent the body from from breaking down the alcohol. And literally, you get alcohol poisoning if you're consuming alcohol after you've eaten this inky cap. Um, so be very careful. You can get quite ill with this eating this perfectly good edible mushroom because it's got some medicinal compounds um, and they actually have developed some drugs around called ant abuse around this mushroom that uh, that's meant to uh, cure people of uh, of alcoholism because it makes them sick when they drink um, 
The more common inky cap that lots of people eat are this guy here, the shaggy mane. And not a really strong tasting mushroom, but it's a nice mushroom, makes a nice soup and does all kinds of nice things. It also has medicinal compounds. Um, they are enzymes that break down cancer cells, stabilize blood sugars, and possess anti-diabetic action, protect the liver. The issue with this one, even though it's quite an edible, good mushroom, and it's difficult to, to, uh, to misdiagnose this and get this as something else, when it fruits, it fruits by the ton. And here we see you can literally pick a wheelbarrow full on this patch of, uh, of shaggy manes. One of the common ones that show up in the North American Mycological Association's poison list, and it's from people overeating them. And so again, they're because they're getting so many of these medicinal compounds in, some of which are antibacterial, and basically what it does, it, uh, it just disrupts your system and you get really sick. So we've never been able to find any, any toxic compounds in them. But this, I believe, 4% of all mushroom poisonings are shaggy mane poisonings, somewhere in that range. Um, and here's the most poisonous edible mushroom of all, the delicious red top. These are eaten by, uh, by especially Northern Europeans and, and loved. Um, and, uh, but again, this one, 6% of all poisonings come from, from Lexinums. And uh, so very, very strong antibacterial. And typically when eating Lexinums, you have to cook them really well. And the issue with Lexinums is when, especially the red ones, we find a lot of them. And so if you haven't cooked them properly, and if you've eaten too many of them, you can get very sick, you know, and I know a number of people that have poisoned themselves with this and they couldn't look at another red top for about two years. And then, yeah, then it wears off and you can go back to enjoying your mushroom. But you've learned your lesson. Um, also, in combination with white with wine and alcohol, um, there's reactions with this one. Some uh, testing done on tumor lines. They haven't done that that um, within clinical trials on 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 humans but uh in laboratory tests they see that it stops and prevents cancer cell growth um and decreased cellular proliferation again and induced apoptopsis might be the vitamin d or might be other compounds in the mushrooms um interesting one is prevents osteoporosis it actually has compounds that'll prevent um osteophytes and osteophytes are cells that that break down and remodel your bones so what they basically do is they suck some of the calcium out of your bones so again if you're older and you've got osteoporosis you have to be careful with this one this one can actually contribute to uh to that uh that uh condition hedgehog beautiful mushroom easy to identify can't really confuse this with with any mushroom. Again, this is a long, long lived mushroom that'll sit out in the woods for, for a, a times, you know, a week to 10 days. So it has strong anti, not just antibacterial and antiviral compounds, but it also has insecticidal compounds in them. So typically you don't find these full of worms, just like chanterelles, very closely related to chanterelles. Um, so delicious mushroom. Um, again, be careful. You know, if it also chelates heavy metals, there's some work being done because it chelates a lot of iron out to treat people who have hematomacrosis, too much iron in the system. But if you're iron deficient, be careful with this one. Um, some shown anti-tumor activities and very an antimicrobial, which would make sense because it's such a long-lived mushroom out in the wild. Um, Russellas, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We're going to do a deeper dive into Russellas. Um, Russellas, you just have to cook really well. And, um, and typically you need to, you need to, uh, 
to neutralize all the acids that are in them, which can give you some severe gastrointestinal upset. There's some absolutely delicious mushrooms here. And then there's some ones that can make you really sick if you're not careful with them. Um, Russellas are a difficult group to deal with. Um, but um, they've also got some nice uh, medicinal compounds. Uh, we're going to do a deeper dive into these. We see a lot of them. The shrimp russula and the uh, and some of the green russulas are kind of more safe ones um, that typically don't cause reaction to people. The hot ones, you taste it, see if it's hot or not, really important. And you can neutralize a lot of that with cooking. Um, and here I included our green lobster. Let me just go back to that. Again, we're looking at this to see if there's the same kind of compounds, antibacterial compounds that are happening um, in the in the lactiflorum, the orange lobster mushroom. These grow on uh, russula decolorans. If you cut a russula decolorans and it kind of turns a light gray, and it stains a light gray, which you kind of see a little bit there. I try and rub these mushrooms. Um, and uh, when I'm in the field, and then I'll come back and say, ah, it's turning gray. And if it's got that light orangey cap, it's uh, likely decolorants and a nice edible mushroom. But again, maybe antibacterial. We don't really know. Something that needs to be looked at. And so another mushroom that you it's very difficult to uh to misidentify because it's got the orange milk there's one that's very close lactarius deterimus which has which has it stains the flesh stains more red than orange and very closely related group anti-tumor activities antimicrobial antiviral the most interesting thing with that one is the uh, it provides positive protection um, and prevents the uh, the islet cells in and pancreatic cell death um, and also prevents other diabetic com uh, complications. So this is a really good mushroom as uh, uh, for blood sugar management. Um, and again, be careful that it might manage it too well. Honey mushrooms, lots of poisonings um, in honey mushrooms. 2% uh, of all, all poisonings um, are honey mushroom poisonings, and these uh, are gastrointestinal and can be quite, quite severe. And this is more typical of what you look what you uh, find with honey mushrooms. They grow in groups and clumps at the base of trees. Um, if you're out of Alberta picking these and, and you're picking them in amongst the hemlocks, those are mushrooms that have been uh, known to make you quite sick. Um, but again, strong antibacterial. And when you find these, you find a ton of them. And you just have to be careful that you're not too greedy when you're eating them. Um, so what... How good is this one? Well, used in, in uh, traditional Chinese medicine, stabilizing blood sugars, lowering cholesterol, activates macrophages. So to clean up, clean up all kinds of stuff in our, in our bodies or old cellular debris, antibacterial. The most exciting newest research is reducing amyloid plaques. And that's in treatment of Alzheimer's and those related dementias. Um, so, <clears throat> This is a mushroom that's coming up in September, any time now. And of course, I'm just gonna end this. We don't have a lot of psilocybes in, in Alberta. Um, we've got a few mushrooms that have, that contain uh, psilocybin like Pluteus salicinus. But again, here's a um, <clears throat> the magic mushroom that has strong, strong medicinal, medicinal characteristics uh, for treatment for depression. And it looks very, very exciting with, uh, with, with all the research that's being done in that area. Um, so lots of medicinal mushrooms. And that's basically it. And they, and they cross over right into all of our edible mushrooms. So be careful with what you should eat. Um, I've got some more video coming up and hopefully we'll get our website up and some, some blog topics and things like that. Um, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me and uh, send me an email. And uh, thanks so much for watching. And uh, if you enjoyed it, yeah, we like the 
the the likes and we like the subscribes and and uh and we'll keep this going for you anyways thanks so much